this with, along with the strangers to neighbors guide this morning do you all have one you'll want one to look at do you have yours you took your bag to your room well we'll get you one to look at well anybody else need one for this session you can share yeah that'll work you can share yes the outcomes benchmarks and standards you want to have that because we will we will look at it well, let me get mine so I can look at it and clip it. Okay, so we are going to walk through these things. How many of you have read them cover to cover? So Jennifer! I should have prizes. <laughs> nice job. Anyone else? Cover to cover? How many people have perused them a little bit? Have looked through, glanced through, read a few sections? How many haven't opened the cover? Haven't looked at these at all? They would have. This well, it would have been. It's available in electronic form. It's on members only. So not in this. So how many of you looked? So on members only before we printed it for you today. How many have looked at that? Okay, got some yeses. Skimmed, yeah, glancing through. So we're gonna walk through it, not word for word, obviously, but we're gonna walk through it to help you get familiar with what's there, know where to look for what you're looking for, how we intend for these to communicate to you and be used by you. Thank you. <laughs> so everyone keeps talking about the changes. Is this a pretty good overview of what the change is? This is, yes. This is the foundation of the change. So, and we do have some folks who are brand new in our network. So let me just give you, I hadn't planned this, but let me just give you a couple minute synopsis of what's happened. So it's two years ago now at our national conference, we had a continuation of years long conversation about the language of mentoring, which is what Bridge of Hope has historically done for the past 30 years, is pair families facing homelessness with mentors, mentoring groups from, from Christian congregations. That language has tripped us up for quite some time for a variety of reasons that I won't go into here. Two years ago, it became really abundantly clear in conversation with you as a network here at the, com at the conference that we needed new language. And so that embarked us on not only uh, looking at how do we uh, rename the work that we're doing, but really evaluating. That coupled with a number of other things, there was, uh, we were facing uh, diminishing outcomes for our program. We were not seeing families have the same degree of success they had had in the previous 25 years. Outcomes were changing uh, for many reasons, some of those being contextual. Our environment has changed. There used to be, 30 years ago, if someone became homeless, you found them a house, you made sure their employment was stable, they were good to go. Now find a house that their employment is going to pay for long term. <laughs> so our, our housing environment is very different. The, the wages have not increased, like rental uh, costs have increased. So economically our environment is very different. The church environment is very different. People do church differently than they used to. It used to be regular attendance was every Sunday, maybe Wednesday nights too. Now regular attendance is once a month. Some studies say twice, once every two months. That's considered regular church attendance in America. If you're going into churches and doing presentations, who's there to hear you? <laughs> A quarter of the congregation on any given Sunday. So you're missing three quarters of the people that you could be speaking to when you're, when you're in a church uh, attempting to uh, in, invite people into the mission of Bridge of Hope. Uh, and additionally, people are looking for, well, we say, the studies show that millennials are really looking for authentic engagement, which could be Bridge of Hope, authentic engagement in the needs of people. Uh, we're also seeing a trend toward wanting short-term intensive projects. Like, I'm willing to invest a day. I'll come and do mission work for one day, and then I'm done. Where Bridge of Hope's inviting people into long-term relationships with families. So changes in the church also complicating uh, and making it challenging for our locations to find churches that are able to pull together groups of 10 to 12 uh, mentors at the time that are willing to come alongside families for an extended period of time. So these factors all coming into play and challenging our work. And so we started, we, we pulled together an innovation team. Jennifer, who's in the room, was part of our innovation team. Johanna was part of our innovation team. We had representatives from a half a dozen of our locations, some expert voices, some members and past members of our board of directors. Uh, really started from scratch. Like, why do we do this? Why do we do this? And, and is it what we've been doing, our, our mission, is it what we're still about? What are the outcomes we want for families? Uh, and, and how are we going to get there? Are we, are we, and how do we need to do things differently in order to 
meet the needs of families facing homelessness and churches were engaging with families in 2016, 17 and forward. So out of the work of that team grew new, uh, new outcomes, uh, benchmarks that we've not operated under before, program standards, and that's what we're going to dive into today. So this is the core. So if you're coming in new, you're lucky in some regards because you just get to learn the new. You don't have to make the shift. <laughs> uh, but that helps you understand kind of where we've, where we've come from. For people who've been doing this for a while, in many ways, some pieces of this are like, oh, thank God, we finally get to change our language. We finally get to do some, you know, attend to some of these needs. For some of it, it's like, oh, this is going to be a little painful. Some of this looks really hard, and are we making it easier for ourselves or harder for ourselves? So, but these are the realities with change. Change is never like a nice sailing, uh, a nice sail on open water. <laughs> it's challenging. But today, I want to walk with you through the the meat of this and invite your questions, invite your discussion, invite your exploration um, of these of of this where we're going as an organization. So let's start. Um, I've already said some of my introduction. Now let's back up to that screen again. So a couple things I want to say about this document as you look at it. This is a living, breathing document. It is not fixed. In fact, there are already typos I found that we need to update. But, <laughs> but, but this is not something that is, is fixed. Like we haven't written this and this is going to stay as it is for the next 30 years. Because what we know is we're doing something new. We're going to learn things. We're going to learn what's going to work well. And we're going to learn what's not going to work. We're going to need to shift and change and continue evolving as our context evolves, as we learn and grow as an organization. So it's not fixed. We'll be evolving this. But don't think it's not going to change every week either. So you're not going to have a spin head trying to keep up with it but this is um, but so it's a fluid document um, it's it's intended to really call us and equip us to achieve our mission and vision and to be accountable to one another one another as partners into an, in a network and and also over all of our other partners in the community so this work I mentioned last night briefly but this work is heavily influenced by the work of Ellen Bassick, Carmela DeCandia, who's been with us the past two days, and Molly Richard, who are the authors of the research, 2015 research, Services Matter, How Housing and Services Can End Family Homelessness. Uh, it presents a solid body of evidence for the effectiveness of holistic and relational services for ending family homelessness. So that kind of, uh, Carmela mentioned yesterday, that research was done in response to a HUD, a federal uh, housing and urban development study that said, oh, families do best if they're just handed vouchers. Um, and, and where the push in our, in our context is toward rapid rehousing. Give people initial startup costs, get them into housing, make sure they have a job, push them out the door. Three months and, and you're gone, you're good. Um, but really looking, if we're really looking at making long-term lasting change for families who are struggling, it takes more than that. It requires, it requires relationship, it requires tending to the whole person, to the trauma that we've been hearing about from Dr. DeCandia, et cetera. So, and one thing I'll say, I'll probably repeat it as we go through. These are your documents. So there is tons of meat in here for grant writing, particularly for those of you who are doing the fundraising and the grant writing piece. Tap into it as if it's your own. You don't have to reference it or reference National as the author. This is yours as part of the Bridge of Hope Network. This is your information and your material. Use it. Use it in your communication. Use it in your grant writing, etc. Okay. So uh, after we did our innovation, or maybe as a continuation of the innovation process, we then launched into reevaluating our vision and mission statements, uh, which we'd had for a long time, which um, were really long and wordy, and you couldn't stick them in your brain and say them in your elevator speech. And so we uh, stepped back and also updated those. But our mission remains the same. But these are, so our vision now, we say is communities where no family is homeless. So this is our big, audacious idea. If we were perfectly successful in all of our work, this is how we would change North America anyway. We would have communities across the country where no family is homeless. Our mission is to engage Christian faith communities in ending family homelessness through neighboring relationships that demonstrate Christ's love. So this is how we work at our, at our vision. So we set our mission as, vision as communities where no family is homeless. This is how we work at that. 
I didn't say, for those of you background-wise, that neighboring, the neighboring language, so we're moving from mentoring language to neighboring language, that we rolled out at last year's conference. Since the last year's conference, our work has been finalizing these standards and developing our new neighboring training and, and beginning to shift all of our resources and programming towards the neighboring language. To engage Christian faith communities in ending family homelessness through neighboring relationships that demonstrate Christ's love. For those of you that are part of affiliate locations, if you want this to be your active mission statement, you, it would probably require board action for you to do that. Uh, and we encourage you to use it just like it is. Our old mission statement kind of had to be modified for local use, but this one doesn't have to be. All right. So then, as I mentioned, we, um, we started with our why, with our mission. Our mission remained the same, but we have modified our outcomes. And so these are the three main outcomes. So these are talking points as you're telling people about Bridge of Hope, what the mi mission of Bridge of Hope is, what our ministry hopes to accomplish in the lives of, w of women and children. Um, safe and sustainable housing, strong and <coughs> resilient families, and supportive neighboring relationships. Wendy? Yes. Is it? You want me to use the mic? You don't want to come up here? <laughs> Actually, I don't think you could all fit around this table now anyway. So, all right, let me put the mic on. Am I going to need help with this, Dana, or is it going to be easy? We'll see. So far, it's looking easy. Here. Oh, you got it. Clipped. I got it clipped. Let me see if I can get this on. <coughs> much hair oh I think I hear myself is that better yeah. okay good let's do that then I maybe won't be as hoarse for my next what, next workshop uh, so what's distinctly two things I'll name distinctly different about this set of outcomes strong and resilient families is one of them so we have all I think in our work work to support families and the well-being of families in a variety of ways but it has never been an intentional focus of Bridge of Hope we have always primarily focused on the women who are parenting families, trusting that helping her and her wellness and stability will also trickle down to her children, and that is true. But we haven't specifically focused on assuring that the needs, the unique needs of children are being met in that family. So really, a new focus on strong, building strong and resilient families is different in our outcomes now. The other thing that people notice is that we previously had an outcome of financial stability through employment, and that is not there anymore, and yet employment is still a priority for Bridge of Hope. Uh, our innovation team largely decided that employment is foundational to safe and stable housing. It's not, we're, it's not necessarily, we are not about assuring that women are being employed. We are about assuring that women are safe and stably housed. Part of that is accomplished by employment. So employment remains a priority for Bridge of Hope, but the employment piece of our work is encompassed in the standards that support the, um, the safe and sustainable housing. Okay. Uh, if any time you want to ask questions, just stick a hand in the air, because I'm going to keep moving, but I will, I will pause at points, but please stick a hand in the air as we go through. After the outcomes, we come down, we're kind of trickling down levels from the big picture down, and then we get to benchmarks. So this is very new for our network. We have identified 12 specific goals and measurements that when met, support our three outcomes. And we're going to look at what each of those are. So they are on, well, let me back up. If you open your book, let me just say, as you open your book, you'll find the table of contents and an introduction. We're talking through some of what the introduction includes now. Uh, following the introduction, you'll find a colorful page that looks like this. This includes, uh, on the left-hand side, the three outcomes that you just saw on the screen before. In the center, the 12 benchmarks that we're going to talk about next. And on the right-hand side, uh, the seven program standards, which we'll then get into, which uh, the seven standards outline our recommended best practices for implementing the Bridge Hill program. They support and connect to the benchmarks, which support and connect to the outcomes. Okay? So but you can be looking at that page right now, if you want. Uh, so you can see the 12, because the 12 benchmarks are not going to be up here on, on your screen. Uh, no. There we go. 
So why benchmarks? Why have we moved to, to benchmarks? So here's, here's several whys. When we're going to intercede in the lives of other people, we have a responsibility to make sure that we're doing more good than we are harm for those individuals and families. So our history books are filled with stories of people who thought they were helping the needy, but really did a lot of damage. For example, Native American children who were taken away from their homes and their families and put in boarding schools where they could become civilized. I'm sure the people who did that were well-intentioned, thinking they were doing something good for these children, but we know historically looking back, it was very harmful. We have a responsibility to be sure that when somebody's looking back 20 years, 50 years from now on the work of Bridge of Hope, that what we did was good for families and not harmful. So our benchmarks help us assure that we're doing the best we can to support families. Um, it assures that we are, well, it sets targets for us to strive toward. Um, and it demands our creativity in meeting those. It assures that we aren't becoming complacent and just using our environmental context as an excuse. Oh, our, our outcomes are down, families aren't faring as well, but that's because of the housing market, and that's because of the employment situation, and that's because of these things. It's not our fault. We could just sit back and say, well, that's just the reality of our time. But it's our responsibility as we strive to help families to assure that we're constantly engaging our own creativity and seeking ways to work against the tide on behalf of families. So, so our benchmarks are setting targets for us and calling us to work at that. Our benchmarks assure that we're being good stewards of the resources that we have. So it's calling us to make good decisions about what God has given us in terms of financial support, volunteer support, etc. It supports our accountability to each other. We are not individual organizations working by ourselves in the world. We are part of a network together. We are supporting a brand, uh, a common brand, a common mission, a common vision. And so these support our accountability to each other. And these are our accountability points. So these are, we are asking each location as you implement Bridge of Hope to commit to working toward meeting the 12 benchmarks. You're going to ask, what happens if we don't? We'll get there. <laughs> uh, uh, but, and then also, our benchmarks communicate our impact. They provide data. As we answer those questions through our data and evaluation, it provides uh, information and data for us to communicate our impact to our donors and supporters and our communities. So what are benchmarks? You got a little bit of that in the why. They're targets or goals. You can see that by looking over the page that's in front of you. They are intended to measure our achievement of our mission. And they are the basis of accountability. They are not permanent. So our benchmarks are not permanent. So these are our 12 benchmarks, <coughs> our start, starting point. But two years from now, we could look at our benchmarks and say, you know, We've nailed this one. We are so good at achieving this particular benchmark. We're going to still be, we're going to continue being good at that. But we notice over here, there's an area that we could really grow. And so we're going to drop this one off our list at the moment and add a new one. This is our new target. We want to work toward growing, building, improving our services in this way. So they're, they're like the rest of the standards. They're fluid. They're not fixed. They could change and evolve over time. So let me just say briefly about the accountability piece. What does it look like if you don't meet these? Um, and I'll say too that the, the standards that we'll then get into and look at more closely, uh, they are not your accountability points. So, so once you get past the benchmark page, which is like page seven and eight, six, seven, something like that, the rest of that, well, our philosophy section is a little different. But really, these standards are our framework. They're, they're recommendations. They're not, you don't feel, don't feel like you have to read through this 41 pages and meet every single thing in this 41 pages. That's not true. But if we find, for your location, if you find that there's one benchmark you're working towards, you're just not nailing it. This year you didn't get there. Next year you didn't get there. Then the standards are your place to start. So really looking at, okay, so what's in these standards? What are we doing that's part of these standards? How are we doing it? Are we doing it well? What's in these standards that we're not doing? Might we implement something in these standards that would help us move toward achieving the benchmark? And then, and then setting goals, making your own plans for moving forward. So they're really your evaluative tool to give you guidance, direction for how do we shift, how do we make changes so we can meet those benchmarks. But you are not accountable to everything in, in the program standards. We'll talk a little bit more, a little bit more about that. 
So there are also, amongst the, the benchmarks, you'll find two, two types of benchmarks. So there are process benchmarks and there are family and volunteer outcome benchmarks. <laughs> so the process benchmarks are for us. They measure our success uh, in, in, our, in, in achieving certain standards for our work. So for example, uh, one our new benchmarks are that we would find housing for families within 60 days of their coming into our programs, and that they would be connected with a group of neighboring volunteers within 60 days of entering the program. Those are process benchmarks, those are for us. That's about holding us accountable to how quickly we are working towards um, these goals for families. Then there are family outcome benchmarks. For example, that 80% of exiting women would be employed. That's an outcome benchmark for families. Or for the neighboring volunteers, at the very bottom, 80% of neighboring volunteers report increased understanding of family homelessness, et cetera. Those are outcome uh, benchmarks. So there's two types that are in there. In the past, we've been measuring outcomes for our families. We've not, we have some, but we haven't very specifically looked at uh, our own goals. Um, we've looked at them, but now we're, we're setting goals for ourselves around um, related to how well we are achieving our own goals of, of housing quickly, of connecting quickly, etc. Uh, one thing, a really important thing I want to say about benchmarks, um, which will take, yeah, I know some conversations have already come up with in our network. Your job, when you're considering what families you invite into your program, what families you're going to serve, how you're going to serve those families, is still to make decisions about what's best for families. So not to make decisions for the sake of your benchmarks. So you have a family coming in that says, I would really like a group of neighboring volunteers for my own congregation. Well, guess what? You're only going to start recruiting that group after you've accepted this mom into the program. So there's a pretty good likelihood that she won't be formally connected or matched by day 60. I don't want you to go, oh, well, we're not going to take her because she'll impact our benchmarks and they'll look worse. Likewise, housing. Somebody has a unique housing situation where it is, uh, maybe they're in a, a temporary housing situation or um, but maybe there's, a, a, there, there's something about their housing situation wherein it would make sense to wait four months before you house them instead of two. Please don't exclude that family from your services or force them to make a plan that's not as effective for themselves because of how it's going to look in your benchmarks. That's why we work with 80% possibilities. That's why we don't shoot for 100% because there are unique circumstances that we still want you to have the flexibility to, to accommodate. And for some of you, you're serving one or two families a year. We recognize that means if you make an exception for one family, your outcomes could be 50% instead of 80%. We get that, we get that. And we'll be looking at those things with you if you find yourself in a place where you're not meeting certain benchmarks. We'll consider those things. So, so please, please don't make decisions about families based on whether or not you're gonna meet your benchmark. Be working at what it takes on your end to meet those benchmarks, but still be accommodating the specific needs of families. Okay. Anybody have questions about the benchmark piece? before we move on into the standards. I'll mention too, if you'd like to be, if you'd like more information on how each of these ben benchmarks are going to be measured, uh, there's a workshop tomorrow at 9.45 called Program Evaluation Using Our New Outcomes and Benchmarks. We'll get into that. So if you're interested in knowing more of the measurement, we'll do that tomorrow. Okay, any questions? We're good. Okay. Uh, all right, so let's move ahead to the standards. So they start on page, oh no, we're not going to go to standards yet. Uh, but we'll do just a brief introduction to standards. So what are the standards? So the standards are best practice, what we've identified as best practice through research, through experience doing, implementing Bridge of Hope's program. Uh, this is what these standards, this is what a high-functioning Bridge of Hope program looks like as we imagine it. 
we recognize that we are human, we are imperfect, so is everything in here the absolute perfect? Maybe not, that'll be part of our learning and refining our standards as we go. But based on research, based on experience, based on what we know, these standards are packed with what we, we believe now are uh, the best practice for Bridge of Hope programs. And this is what a high functioning Bridge of Hope program would look like if you were doing all of these, which is really not realistic, but high functioning Bridge of Hope program. These are designed to offer flexibility to locations. So before we had a program manual, we asked locations, particularly when they were starting up, to pretty much implement that program manual as it was. There is always room for flexibility as you learn to know the strengths of your organization, the strengths and the needs in your community, how you work with families, etc. Always room for flexibility. And many of you have innovated and offered great ideas and resources to the rest of their network through your own uh, innovation and flexibility with those tools. Uh, but this is even more flexible, we hope, and you may experience it differently, but it's our intention that it would be flexible. And so it's our intention, so you'll find, for example, uh, in the policy section of one of these standard sections that it'll have a suggestion of what policies you should have. So let's say rental assistance, for example. Um, it'll have a, you should have a policy about how you go about implementing rental assistance. What it doesn't say is what your policy should be. But it's just saying a high-functioning Bridge of Hope would have a standard set practice for how you go about implementing and determining rental assistance for families. Not that it's some willy-nilly hodgepodge thing that if your staff person changes next week, your rental assistance planning is also going to change. But that there be a policy, a guideline, so your staff know these are the, this is a framework within which I work. But it's up to your location to decide what that policy is. We may still offer recommendations, and we will, based on experience in our network. But you have flexibility to decide exactly what that policy is for your location. So that's our intent. And, um, um, and for uh, specifically for program sites that are programs within a larger organization, often your larger organization may already have some policies in place about some of these things. We're not asking you to now, when well, you have policies for your big organization, then your Bridge of Hope program has to have a different set. It can be, it can be, it can uh, encompass an entire organization for program site type locations. All right. Uh, and again, I said this already, the standards are not accountability points. They are a starting place for achieving benchmarks, a place that you can go to look to to consider ideas for building upon your uh, achievement of benchmarks, but they're not accountability points. We aren't going to come to you and say, hey, you're not implementing this piece of this standard because these are intended to be flexible guidelines. Okay? There are uh, so the format, so as you get into each of the standard sections, there's seven standard sections. I think that's my next slide. I thought they were reversed. Uh, the format is in each standard section. And if you want to turn to the one on page eight, is it? Vision and philosophy? Ten. Ten, sorry. Uh, page 10, vision and philosophy, you can kind of follow what the standard is. Each standard will start with a summary section, just kind of a brief overview of what that section is about followed by principles. So the principles are what we believe about this standard area and or how Bridge of Hope addresses it. Those are followed by rationale. The rationale section is where you'll find uh, research and data and, um, and theory thinking about why we believe what we do that's outlined in these principles. The rationale section and principles, that's where you'll find a lot of your grant writing material because it's got a lot of good research and resources in there. And then that's followed by standards, within the standards, uh, policy standards, staffing standards, and activity standards. And again, these are recommendations. Here are policies that we recommend you have. Here are strengths, training, background, exposure, whatever, that we recommend your staff have. And here are activities that we recommend you include or consider including as part of the work that you do with families and or neighboring volunteers. So that's the structure. And then these are the seven standard areas, which you'll see back on that colorful page. Um, in this right-hand column, you'll see the seven. Vision and philosophy, housing, improving financial position, building family resilience, implementing case management, creating neighborhoods of support, and engaging Christian faith communities. The colors on this paper have meaning. So you'll see that the benchmarks, uh, the blue benchmarks, support the blue outcome. The yellow benchmarks support the yellow outcome. Green benchmarks support the green outcome. 
In the standards, you'll see a variety of colors in the background of each of those standards. If what, what the color, how do I say this? So whatever colors are behind that standard, it connects with the same colors of benchmarks and outcomes. So you'll see the, uh, the very bottom one, for example, engaging Christian faith communities on your chart only has green behind it. It connects with the support of neighboring relationships. So that's just a visual for those of you who are visual for how they all connect and support one another. All right. Nope, oh, we're going to stop there. All right, I invite you to turn to page eight, so backing up a little bit, in your outcomes booklet there. <coughs> Bridge of Hope definitions. Nothing on your screen now. You get to look at your book. So these definitions, I want to know, these definitions kind of define the terms as you encounter them in uh, the standards. But these also are new definitions for our language. So these are important, they're significant. These just aren't random definitions for this document. This is our new common language as a network. So these are important for branding, for identity standards, to be commonly using the same language as we build something new in terms of Bridge of Hope and, and how we approach our ministry. So I'm gonna walk through them briefly just to connect them to what, they, what language they replace. But I want you to become familiar with them. And I will admit right now that saying groups of neighboring volunteers is a mouthful and it's going to be a hard shift, but please work at it. <laughs> so just walking down through these. Bridge of Hope Neighborhood or the Bridge of Hope Neighborhood of Support. This is now our three-way partnership. This is what we call the whole group, the neighboring volunteers, the neighboring family, and you as the family resource coordinator, case manager, or neighboring resource specialist. I know that we will not all have the same name, but that's, that's the group, the whole team, the whole three partnership team is the Neighborhood of Support. Uh, the Bridge of Hope Neighboring Training, that is the new title for uh, the, neighbor, the training that many of you experienced earlier with Christy. Uh, maybe the first half, maybe some of you didn't, uh, but that's the title of our new training, the, the name that's on the training kits, etc. Uh, replaces our mentoring training. Christian Faith Communities, that new language is not only a replacement word, but it's an expanded opportunity. So we have previously worked with churches. One church, one family. A few years ago we expanded that to say you can bring two groups together from two churches to form one group where a church can't identify enough people uh, to form a single group. But Christian faith communities is a little more expansive. Now we are offering the opportunity to engage uh, community Bible studies, um, house churches, uh, other faith-based worshiping bodies. So this is not an opportunity for you to go out and say, oh, here's a Christian from this neighborhood, and here's a Christian from that church, and here's a Christian I met at work, and pull them all into a hodgepodge group. We are still looking for groups that already have some kind of working relationship with one another as a worshiping or faith-based community, like a Bible study, which may include people from multiple churches or somebody who's not currently attending a church, etc. But we're going to expand the opportunities for you as you struggle, many of you struggle to uh, get churches to engage and commit to the ministry of neighboring now. So offering some additional opportunities. So Christian faith communities are a new language. If you say church, that's still okay because that's still going to be the majority of the places that your uh, groups come from. So you can still say church, but I invite you particularly in your public communication, your written communication, etc. to expand that to include so, so it's more inclusive of uh, the opportunities we want to make available. Uh, next, locations. This isn't new language, um, but maybe new to some. We have, of course, affiliate type locations in our network, program sites in our network, one church sites in our network. If you're relatively new to the network and you don't know what all that means, feel free to ask me afterwards. We're not going to go into that. But we refer to you all as Bridge of Hope locations. That's just our broad language that's common for every one of you. Neighborhood launch is the next word on the list. The neighborhood launch is our new language for our match night. 
That's another language shift. It's really easy to say match night. <laughs> but we are launching uh, a new neighborhood. We're moving in. We're all moving into the neighborhood together. And so neighborhood launch is our new language for, for those uh, initial events where we're introducing the neighboring family to the group of neighboring volunteers. Uh, next is the neighborhood resource specialist or case manager. Um, we have in our affiliate type locations used the language of family resource coordinator historically because we're increasing our focus on um, on the role of the neighboring volunteers and wanting to, uh, to alter the way the neighborhood works together a bit, we're moving that to neighborhood resource specialists really to, to emphasize that the role that the case manager plays in coordinating and facilitating the relationships that form in this neighborhood. Uh, case manager, we know that those of you with program from program sites are often going to hold, uh, staff are often going to hold multiple roles in an organization and so you may be, uh, case manager is kind of that generic language for those of you who are still going to work with different titles and then uh, neighborhood resource specialist and that's fine. Neighboring, neighboring is the act of loving, encouraging and supporting a family facing homelessness. So that is what Bridge of Hope is now doing. We are no longer mentoring we are neighboring. Uh, next on the page there is neighboring family or family or family facing homelessness. So you've heard me refer to the family in Bridge of Hope as the neighboring family. You don't have to use neighboring family all the time in your public communication that may be helpful. But families, families facing homelessness or the neighboring family in that three-way partnership. Next page, the neighborhood gathering. This language replaces our Bridge of Hope Night gathering and some are Bridge of Hope Night events. Uh, some locations, probably half of you, have already kind of played with the language of Bridge of Hope Nights. Uh, neighborhood gathering is what we're proposing um, be your replacement language for the Bridge of Hope Night opportunities. Neighboring volunteers, they are of course our mentors or our former mentors, our now neighboring volunteers. A change I'll note there, but you'll see it in multiple places, is that uh, we have historically recommended groups of 10 to 12 mentors. We are now suggesting groups of 6 to 10 neighboring volunteers. Probably most fundamentally to make it easier to recruit a group because getting 10 to 12 is becoming increasingly difficult. We've also heard plenty of feedback from many of you about 10 to 12 potentially being an overwhelming number for a woman and a family that's experienced a lot of trauma. Um, uh, some of you want us to go lower than that six number. We haven't done that because we have no precedent to say, yeah, three works great. Um, but you'll find uh, pretty much everywhere, it doesn't have it right here, but you'll find throughout the rest of the document and in Covenant and Program Site um, uh, documents that it'll say typically six to 12, or I'm sorry, typically six to 10 or approximately six to 10. That means if you match a family with a group of five, it's okay. It's okay, but we will be looking at that over time. We'll look at that data to see are our smaller groups, our families supported by smaller groups having the same outcomes as families uh, supported by larger groups? Are those outcomes positive? And maybe we'll find ourselves at expanding that range um, in future years. But for now, six to 10 is our recommended number approximately, so there's wiggle room. You can have 11, you can have a few, a less. Uh, <coughs> neighbors. I want to say something about the term neighbors. We encourage you not to call the neighboring volunteers neighbors uh, exclusively. If we, it, see, it feels easy, just like before we talked about them as mentors. It feels easy to say the neighbors. But we really want everybody in the group to be part of the neighborhood and everyone to be neighbors. And so if you're a neighboring volunteer, the neighboring family is your neighbor in this group. The case manager is your neighbor in this group. So if you're going to talk about the neighbors, including the family, the neighboring volunteers, everybody, that's great. Use that language. But if you're talking about the neighboring volunteers and refer to them just the neighbors, that suggests that the family isn't one of those neighbors. And that's one of the things that we want to get away from is that kind of exclusive language for, um, that separates family from, from the uh, volunteers. Uh, and then the last one on the list is social capital. I'm not going to talk a lot about uh, that right in this moment, but we added it in there because it is the newer, probably the newest concept, uh, not a brand new concept, but the newest emphasis for Bridge of Hope uh, ministry is really building social capital for families through the networks of um, 
of neighboring volunteers. And you'll hear more about that from Margot when she talks to us at the end of, in the next hour. And Becca, can you remind me what time we're done? 2.45. 2.45, okay, good, thank you. All right, any questions about the definitions? We start this language you <laughs> as much as we can. Some of our locations have already started this language change in their public communication and so forth. If you are beginning to use the neighboring training and the new resources, yep, you start this language now. The, the groups we have that we've trained as mentors, and that's how they identify themselves. Do you mm -hmm. have a way to present this so they don't wonder like what we're talking about? Mm -hmm. Because I think for us it's going to be tricky to have two groups mentors. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm thinking of presenting. Mm -hmm. So, a couple of suggestions. One would be, like, if you're gathering all your groups together at a Bridge of Hope night, which is where the two differently trained groups would come together, um, like when you're doing that for the first time, or even for over a couple meetings, show the neighboring the video from last year that introduces the change in language and just share that there's a change in language and new training opportunities etc um, some locations have begun ha are still using the mentoring training but building the neighboring language into that in anticipation of the new training coming out so yeah if you're implementing this year yep find ways to start using it used it with our secular Franciscans a little bit yes because we knew it was coming so from right. the beginning right if your location is not implementing until next year or later, you don't have to touch this language yet. So, but once you begin implementation, then the shift happens. Yes? And for board members, we're really presenting this to them. Because Say, ask your question completely. I want to make sure I'm understanding what you're... Is there any type of webinar or anything to introduce this to board members? Uh, or is that us? Me. <laughs> it can be, and your board members no longer here. Well, some board members are hearing it here. <laughs> yes, um, board members that have been around, so your board leaders have, were here last year, heard the introduction to the language. All of this um, has been shared through email communication or monthly e news. How much boards have looked at it and engaged, we don't know, but we'll be looking at that. Some opportunities for 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 sharing this this video or this um, workshop is being videoed, and I'm probably walking off camera right now. <laughs> this is being videoed, so it's something that you can invite board members to watch or uh, show clips of in a training. But we'll be talking about that. That's kind of next on our plate in terms of um, updating our uh, new staff. <clears throat> case manager training, et cetera. And, but that's kind of easier, but how do we help those who've been in the network shift to the new? And so that'll be on our, that'll be soon. Soon, we'll be working at that. But good question. Any other questions? Okay. So, let me see. So now we're gonna dive into the program standards a little bit. And we're going to start, we're going to look together at the vision and philosophy section because this is our core, this is our core, this is our vision and philosophy. This is the foundational beliefs of Bridge of Hope. And so, while I've said that these aren't accountability points, this is your primary one. Like, you really want to be working consistently with what you find in the vision and philosophy because this is the core of Bridge of Hope's program. So know these, be familiar with these. But for those of you who have been in the network for a while, it's not all shockingly new. <laughs> Much of it is very familiar, but there are some new focuses and emphases. So we'll walk through those together. Then we're going to take the other six standard areas and I'm going to let you work in small groups to answer a few, to look through an assigned area and, and pull out some specific informa information to share back. Okay? So let's look at vision and philosophy. So and we're going to look at this in terms of what's unique and what's new. So we're not going to read every detail of it right now because like I said, some of this is familiar. We've been doing this for a long time. But we're going to look at what's unique and what's new. For you who are board members, what's unique is what you want to really pay attention to. And there might be some overlap. Because what's unique, that's your talking points as an ambassadors, as fundraisers, etc. For saying what, bridge of, what sets Bridge of Hope apart 
um, from what other homeless service agencies are doing, what's unique about our program um, that we're inviting you to participate in, sponsor, fund, etc. <coughs> so we're starting with what's unique, and we're looking at principles and mostly I might have, yeah, these are all principles. So uh, that's in your guide. Starts right on page 10. I believe, is that correct? Yeah. My, my version is numbered differently than the version that got printed. <laughs> so I'm trying to make the transition here as I share numbers. So starting on page 10, we're looking at principles. These are what's unique about Bridge of Hope in the world of homelessness services. Um, Bridge of Hope serves families at risk of homelessness. That's principle two. This is unique because uh, in terms of federally funded homelessness service programs right now, there's not enough money to go around, and so services are prioritized for those who are literally homeless, which is important and, and valuable, but that excludes all families who are doubled up. And what we know is that a lot of families are doubled up. Bridge of Hope still views those families as homeless. There are also families at risk of homelessness, two weeks away from eviction, about to be uh, thrown out of uh, someone's home where they've been staying, etc. We view those families still as at risk of homeless and eligible for Bridge of Hope services. And so uh, that is unique in, the terms, in terms of homeless service realm. It's unique that we serve families at risk as well as those who are literally homeless. Uh, principle number three, we serve families parenting dependent children under age 18. Uh, we do not serve single men, we do not serve single women who are homeless, we do not serve, uh, focus on veteran homelessness. If there's not children involved, we serve families where children are experiencing homelessness. There is an expansion in our services, so historically for 30 years Bridge of Hope has served women with children, single women with children. Uh, now we make that up to you as a location. Um, you are welcome to serve families with, of different structures, so uh, t two parent families with children, single dads raising children, grandparents raising grandchildren, etc. That's local discretion. You can make that decision. What I will say is Bridge of Hope's program has been tried and true and tested with women with children. Men are a very different population. Two parent families are a different population. So we have not tested how well all these materials and, um, and programming works for those families. But we know that some of you as program sites are working with families of different structures and have said, we think this could work for family A, family B, and we invite you to consider those opportunities if that makes sense to your location. Also unique to Bridge of Hope, of course, is our three-way three -way partnership. That's in principle four. Social capital, whoops, sorry. Go back. Social capital is a new emphasis there, uh, which you'll hear more about if you attend the next the workshop after our next keynote on the neighborhood, the Bridge of Hope neighborhood. Uh, and you'll hear more about from Margo as she shares with us in the keynote speech this afternoon. But our three-way partnership has always been the core, a core uniqueness to Bridge of Hope, engaging the groups of neighboring volunteers and supporting families. <coughs> Principle four, also, we are engaging the church to show Christ's love by ending homelessness. This is not new, new but this is unique to Bridge of Hope. And principle six, uh, staff and volu or volunteers are designated to engage and recruit churches or Christian faith communities in engaging in the mission and ministry of Bridge of Hope. Unique to Bridge of Hope because we are in the business of connecting families with groups of neighboring volunteers. So those are the unique pieces in the vision and philosophy. Let's look at what's new. Oh, there's more unique, sorry. Uh, principle number seven, each family is connected with a neighborhood of support. Not new, but definitely unique about Bridge of Hope. Uh, focus on building social capital. That is both new and unique. Um, although I'll mention that this year at the National Alliance to End Homelessness Conference in Washington, D.C., there is a new buzz about social capital. That is a new thing that's being tended to in homelessness services, just a recognition that <coughs> there are limitations in rapid rehousing and finding families housing and employment and moving them on. And where families have deficits in social support, they destabilize more quickly. And so that's becoming more uh, common language and getting more attention in homelessness services, broadly speaking 
That is a uniqueness of Bridge of Hope. We've been working at building social capital for the past three years. Now we're going to focus more in terms of what that means in expanding a, a family's social capital. But we've been doing that. We've been building those network, networks of support and we'll continue to do that. Uh, principle eight, <coughs> modeled after housing first. Something I want to say about that. So Bridge of Hope has always been housing first. Housing first being a philosophy that says that families are best helped by finding them housing first, resolving that crisis, and then working at helping to stabilize the family and, and fill in um, the needs that will stabilize them and allow them to maintain that service or that home long term. Compared to some of the more traditional models, uh, rescue missions for example of 30 years ago and more where you brought families into a facility, you fixed them, and then you got them a home. Housing first is about taking care of the housing need first and then working at the other needs that a family presents. We can no longer claim to be housing first. We can claim to be modeled after housing first, even though we were doing it first. Uh, because, <laughs> because the federal definitions have evolved. And as rapid rehousing came on the scene, uh, the housing first definition has evolved to follow rapid rehousing. So now part of the definition of housing first is that you erect no barriers to service. Well, as long as we require each family to receive support from a group of neighboring volunteers, that's a barrier. We can't say yes to every family that steps up to our door because if they say, I don't want neighboring volunteers, we, then our program is not for them. So because that is technically a barrier, no matter how else we do our family selection process, we are erecting a barrier or no longer purely housing first. We are still modeled after housing first and we were doing it first. Uh, there is all new neighboring training. That is in principle 10. Hopefully a number of you were introduced to that already and, and will be in the near future if not already. And, uh, and, rest, and this is from the rationale section. A Bridge of Hope provides holistic services. We heard from Dr. Kitakandia the need for holistic services, but increasingly services across the scope of homelessness services are not focused on holistic support, but Bridge of Hope is. So those are the uniquenesses coming from vision and philosophy. Let's look at what's new. Of course, new language. That you heard last year. We have all new language that we have to get used to saying and implementing and sharing. And for those of, who've been supporters, our donors and volunteers of years, we have new language to share with them and to, to uh, get their excitement and buy-in for. Uh, principle three in this section, we serve families, including but not exclusively, headed by women. The local discretion, I mentioned that piece already, that is new for Bridge of Hope, that there's now local discretion in discer discerning the structure of the families as long as there are children under 18. Uh, we've also mentioned that groups of neighboring volunteers will typically be 6 to 10 rather than 8 to 12. That is a shift in downsizing our groups. Um, also new, groups of neighboring volunteers are from Christian faith communities or worshiping bodies like Bible studies, etc., as well as from traditional church congregations. And uh, next, neighboring volunteers are recruited in advance. That is not really new, but it is newly reprioritized. So historically, groups of neighboring volunteers or mentors in the past were recruited ahead of selecting families and serving families in Bridge of Hope. As the challenges of recruiting churches increased and agencies, your locations, wanted to respond to families in need in the moment, we've shifted as a network to uh, accepting families first, finding churches second, and sometimes having inordinate amounts of time uh, pass before uh, the support system is brought into the relationship. So newly reprioritized re is recruiting and bringing in those neighboring volunteers before we're accepting families. Let's see if there's more. I see a question. Go ahead. Can you like, so I'm, I'm sorry, I just thought like, oh, what I heard mm -hmm. was contradictory. So we do find the church volunteers in advance. Yes. Okay. So, so that contradicts something you heard here at the conference? No, or what you're hearing? You were speaking to the challenges that people had faced. Yes, okay. They were finding the family first. Yes. And then the church. Yes. So that's not happening. That's how, that's not what we're going to do in the future. So that's what's been occurring over, over recent years. Yeah. Us, I think. Yep. So, Wendy, yes. what happens when there's a time span between finding the neighboring volunteers and onboarding a new client? Now, I've not been mm -hmm. here that long, but mm -hmm. what I'm sort of hearing is 
they have you know, found a group of, I guess they want to call them mentors, but there's been a time delay before they onboard a new client. So during that time, there's been some deterioration. Some people move, some people lose interest, dynamics change. So by the time you match them yeah. up, this group looks like this today, but it doesn't look like it here. Yes, that can happen, yes. So yeah, that happens. A couple thoughts about that. Um, if you have a church that's already engaged, ready to go, but you're not, for other reasons, ready to bring in a family or are, uh, don't have families in need, which I can't imagine, but, but for whatever reason, don't have a family when that church is coming on, a couple thoughts. One is don't train that church now. Wait until the family comes in because, like you said, till you get to the time a family come in, you could your church, your group could look different, and then you'll be retraining anyway. Um, so hold off on that on that training. But then I encourage you to find other ways to engage that family. If you're doing neighborhood gatherings and you need people to provide childcare, you need people to provide meals, you need a church to host uh, the event, you need volunteers to stuff envelopes, you need volunteers to help with a fundraising event, whatever the case may be, find ways to engage those churches, those neighboring volunteers in other activities of your organization. Keep them posted on what's going on. Keep them posted on when you expect to accept a family into your program, etc. But yeah, there'll be some work in keeping them engaged, but you might find that they're great supporters in other ways as well as potential neighboring volunteers. So, confidentiality-wise, because we're going to bring a bigger group in to our women, is there guidelines for introducing that to the, our new family? Ask, historically, ask that again. Historically, the women who come in know <laughs> that they're going to see, I mean, for, say, um, we call it Hope Gathering, so Neighborhood Gathering. Mm -hmm. They've seen our program committee who get introduced, and mm -hmm. they see other neighboring volunteers who are already matched. So mm -hmm. now we're going to bring in a bigger group of state volunteers. I mean, they really are, mm -hmm. but they don't know. Will that violate mm -hmm. any confidentiality? Not if you're not. I mean, if you have, yeah, right. Like if you have some future neighboring volunteers coming to serve the meal, they're there to serve the meal. You're not saying, oh, this person is a neighboring volunteer, or this one is the mom, and this one is exactly. Okay. It's the same kind of thing. Yep. Yeah. Any other questions about that? Let's see if I have another slide of what's new. We do. So principle seven, focus on building social capital. That's a repeat from what's unique. So really just newly focused on that and attending to what it means to tap into the networks of each of our neighboring volunteers as extended networks of support or resources for the families that we're working with. Uh, principle eight, it's modeled after housing first, no longer purely housing first. Rental assistance, that's in principle nine. So you'll see a shift in numbers there as well. Rental assistance provided for six to 12 months rather than nine to 15. Um, it was within my tenure at Bridge of Hope, which is the past 10 years, that we extended it to nine to 15. What, I don't know how much I wanna go into to thinking here, but um, what we've seen happen for some locations is this tendency then to, to um, a couple things, either uh, put on paper right up front, this is, you're gonna get 15 months of rental assistance. Then the family's like ready to go at 12 months. They're kind of done with you. They're kind of done with the services, but they're not going anywhere because they want that other three months of rental assistance you promised them. So part of that is not putting everything out there at the beginning, but here, let's create a rental assistance plan for your first four months and then we'll reevaluate and go forward. Uh, but location struggling to know when to end that rental. Uh, rental assistance and um, and families also getting pretty comfortable with having that rental assistance and not necessarily feeling um, enough pressure to to work at at building their own um, financial network and money management skills and employment income etc. Uh, so we'll be looking in the next year or so really evaluating critical time intervention. Some of you may be familiar with that. It's uh, actually designed for uh, people with mental health conditions that need that have more significant needs than many of our families do in terms of mental health care. Um, yet it's designed to assure that we're not over serving families, that we're not uh, Supporting them so long that, that we're now enabling rather than empowering them to, to become stabilized on their own. 
All new training, you've heard that one before. Also, our services, this is not all new, but services are family-centered, strengths-based, trauma-informed with the spirit of cultural humility. So we'll be focusing, you'll find all of those elements in the new neighboring training. You'll find all of those elements as we update our online um, case manager training. Uh, those will be new focus. We'll be focusing on providing more training in those areas like we have in the past day and a half with Dr. DeCamp. <coughs> I think that's it, yeah. Questions about the unique or the new or anything else you might have glanced at while you were looking through those principles. Okay. All right, so what I would like to do is invite you to form six groups to look at the other standards. Each group will look at a standard. What I don't want is for people who are brand new to our network to be in a group with people who are brand new to our network. Because you won't be able to answer the question. <coughs> so I want each group to have some people who have been around for a while, some people who are new. So that means you've got to get up out of your seats and maybe reposition a little bit. Um, 